Welcome to Stroke Cover Little Meter Room 4. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here with this week's book review, and you might have noticed that there was no skit. Here's the way that I will uh, relay that message. The Elephant Man is a movie that is a very heartfelt movie, a uh, very sad movie, a very important movie. One thing you might not know about that movie is the fact that Mel Brooks was one of the producers. The reason you might not know that is Mel Brooks did not want to be uh, known as one of the producers because he didn't want people to think that he was making fun of the story. Uh, the reason we did not have a skit for this week's book review is because of that very same thing. That's a beautiful way to put it. It is. Uh, I'd highly suggest if you are looking for a little bit more to this, Ellie Weissel has a lot of interviews. Hit the YouTube machine, read a little bit more about this, hear a little bit more about this. You're going to get a lot more from just us, you know, having a skit. Right. So, in that sense, this week we are doing something very different. Uh, our first venture into nonfiction. Uh, this is Night by Ellie Weissel. And I hope I'm saying Weissel right. You're the yes. German speaker in here. I believe so. So, uh, good things and bad things. What do you want to talk about? Uh, three good things. This is just an important piece of literature. Okay. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, something with that later. I've got a talking point for that. The way godlessness is played with in this piece is just astounding. And as someone who has lost their faith and, and ended up on the atheistic side of things, it is hard not to recognize the steps along the way that are happening. I like that. Um, Third, you really get the feeling that things, in, the events in this novel are happening right now. Right? Okay. This does not feel like a 70-year-old novel if, or something that happened 70 years ago. It feels like you're there. Okay. Uh, I have that this is an example of absolutely beautiful writing in a nonfiction setting. This is literary writing being used in nonfiction. It's wonderful. Reads beautifully. Uh, this is so painful and so terrible that if it were not true, you would not believe it. Right. And uh, a piece of this is going to live within you. You're going to take some of this home. Yeah. Uh, three bad things. My first one is a piece of this is going to live in you. You're going to take this home. Uh, that is good and bad, for yeah. sure. Uh, you need a pick me up in the end, and this is not a Hollywood ending. This is a very real ending. It was over. That's it. And that's how it ends. Uh, and finally, it's unfortunate that this book, in my opinion, is so often pushed to the high school readership. I think it's great that young readers are experiencing this and learning from this early on, but I think if you read it in high school, a lot of people are never going to read this again, and they're not going to get the full brunt of it. Right. Yours? Uh, if you're not prepared for this, this will be lost on you, yeah. because this is not a gory uh, tale. Right? Okay. Even, even the gore that happens, the terrible things that happen, are written about in such a, 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 a just literary way, right? Uh, so with so much class that you don't, if you are not, if you are not privy to those things which are actually happening, you don't really get it. All right. Right. Um, as far as a piece of, piece of literature goes, this does not have shape. All right. right. There's no there's no classic rise and fall to this. This is just a march through a death camp. Correct. Uh, and third, uh, this story is started with the idea that things are coming to a close, right? But things are coming to a close right as this story is starting. Yeah. It's, and I, I, I wish that was played with a little bit more. Again, these are all things that, th they're not really bad things. No, it, it's hard to analyze nonfiction as fiction. And it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to analyze something like this in the way that you might read Harry Potter, for example. Exactly. Right? It is a different reading, and it's hard to say, you know, this is this man's experience. It's hard to say, well, I wish you would have said this instead. It would have felt right. better. No, this is his experience. Uh, so negative things are hard to analyze in this. However, positive things. This book is riddled with beautiful writing. Beautiful oh, yes. quotes. Yes. Uh, do you have a few quotes? I have a ton. Um, a you ton. go first because I've got an actual story from the piece that I think needs relayed. Okay. I'm just going to hit. I have three quick snippets. Okay. Uh, first one from page 21. Night. No one was praying for the night to pass quickly. The stars were but sparks in the immense conflagration that was consuming us. This conflagration to, uh, to be extinguished one day. Nothing would be left in the sky but extinct stars and unseeing eyes. I, I, to take nonfiction and to write it in such a literary way. Ugh. Another? Or you want to back and forth? How do you want to do this? You go, you okay, go. I'm, I'm going to kill it. A little longer. And so he remained for more than a half... Uh, 
And so he remained for more than half an hour, lingering between life and death, writhing before our eyes. And we were forced to look at him at close range. He was still alive when I passed him. His tongue was still red, his eyes not yet extinguished. Behind me, I heard the same man asking, For God's sake, where is God? And from within me, I heard a voice answering, Where is he? This is where, hanging from the gallows. That night, the soup tasted of corpses. Ugh! Oh. And finally, one more from page 95 towards the end of the novel. The darkness enveloped us. All I could hear was the violin. And if it was Juliet's soul, and it was as if Juliet's soul had become his bow. He was playing his life. His whole being was gliding over the strings. His unfilled hopes, his charred past, his extinguished future. He played that which, we, that which he would never play again. That is so beautiful and so hauntingly terrifying to know that that happened. And to capture it with those words is unrivaled. Yeah. Just amazing. <clears throat> Story? Yeah. Um, this is going to take a little bit, so I hope you're along for the ride. One Sunday, as half our group, including my father, was at work, the others, including me, took the opportunity to stay and rest. Around 10 o'clock, the sirens started to go off. Alert. The block Alsta gathered us inside the blocks while the SS took refuge in the shelters. As it was relatively easy to escape during an alert, the guards left the watchtowers and the electric current in the barbed wire was cut. The standing order to the SS was to shoot anyone found outside the block. In no time, the camp had the look of an abandoned ship. No living soul in the alleys. Next to the kitchen, two cauldrons of hot steaming soup had been left unattended. Two cauldrons of soup. Smack in the middle of the road, two cauldrons of soup with no one to guard them. A royal feast going to waste. Supreme temptation. Hundreds of eyes were looking at them, shining with desire. Two lambs with hundreds of wolves lying in wait for them. Two lambs without a shepherd, free for the taking. But who would dare? Fear was, the great, was, fear was greater than hunger. Suddenly we saw the door of block 37 open slightly. A man appeared, crawling snake-like in the direction of the cauldrons. Hundreds of eyes were watching his every move. Hundreds of men were crawling with him, scraping their bodies with his on the stones. All hearts trembled, but mostly with envy. He was the one who had dared. He reached the first cauldron, hearts pounding harder. He had succeeded. Jealously, jealousy devoured it, us, consumed us. We never thought to admire him. Poor hero committing suicide for a ration or two of soup. In our minds, he was already dead. Laying on the ground near the cauldron, he was trying to lift himself to the cauldron's rim. Either out of weakness or out of fear, he remained there, undoubtedly, to muster his strength. At last, he succeeded in pulling himself up to the rim. For a second, he seemed to be looking at, him, looking at himself in the soup, looking for his ghostly reflection there. Then, for no apparent reason, he let out a terrible scream, a death rattle such as I had never heard before, and, wi and with open mouth, thrust his head towards the still steaming liquid. We jumped at the sound of the shot, falling to the ground, his face stained by the soup. The man writhed a few seconds at the base of the cauldron, and he was still. Damn. Yeah. That, again, not only is that capturing a real moment, but it's written in such a beautiful way that it's just worthy of fine writership. And it is a literary reference. This is Narcissus, right? Okay. But in this world, Narcissus wants no more than a taste of soup. Yeah. Right? Uh, this piece... Just to preface this, uh, I, first and foremost, I'd highly suggest everyone read this. I, if there's one to take from this channel to pull up and read, this is a quick read. This is something you will grow from. This is 120 pages? It's very short. 120, exactly. Uh, this will change you. This is one that you're going to read, and it's going to creep in the back of your mind, and it's going to take you out for the night. Uh, and, and it's images like that that stick with you. You uh, know, I believe it was Tolstoy who said that the... The purpose of literature mm -hmm. is that we gain empathy for other people. So if that is the measure of literature, this is second to nothing I've ever read, right? This 
this builds empathy, this builds sympathy like nothing I have ever read. If I can just carry on with that thought. Uh, that last quote I read about the violin and Juliac, I hope I'm saying that name right. Uh, we've already been butchered once this week for our mispronunciation of Steve. foreign names. Sorry. Uh, if I can continue, just a couple more paragraphs after that. I shall never forget Juliac. How could I forget his concert? Uh, how could I forget this concert given before an audience of the dead and the dying? Even today, when I hear a particular piece by Beethoven, my eyes close and out of the darkness emerges the pale and melancholy face of my Polish comrade, bidding farewell to an audience of dying men. I don't know how long he played. I was overcome by sleep. When I awoke at daybreak, I saw Juliac facing me, hunching over, dead. Next to him lay his violin, trampled, an eerily poignant little corpse. That is so fucking powerful, and, and that is so real, and that is so well written, that's insanity to me. An eerily poignant little corpse. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, uh. So, uh, See, this is, this is full of pretty language and stark thought. It is. Um, there is. There's a story about Lincoln I got from Lincoln's Melancholy, where he, uh, it, this is the midst of the Civil War, and Lincoln is still attending church. And after one of the services, he goes up to his pastor, and, he's, and the pastor's talking to him about everything, and his pastor says, uh, he's talking about God, and he says, uh, I hope we're on, um, what is it? I hope God is on our side. And uh, Lincoln stops him, and he says, no, no, no. I hope we are on his. Yeah. And that's, that's the type of stark thought and pretty language that this book is filled with. It is, right? it is. Th these, little, these little nuggets of things that just completely change your perspective and let you know you were looking at it wrong. Yes. Uh, and you, that does bring up, there's a lot of thought that's brought up from this, and I, I hope we can you know, touch on a couple of these things. Uh, where everybody always says we have the longest reviews going, but they're not long enough. Yeah. Uh, you could talk for this for days. Uh, can we fault those, those uh, Jewish people who did what they had to do to survive? Those playing the role of the officers or whatever, those who are literally torturing their fellow Jewish man in order to survive. You know, one thing this made me think of was, um, and I hope that this does not come across in a mocking fashion or, or anything like that, just hear me out. Um, literature tells us a lot about ourselves, right? Yes. No matter what type of literature, I've often said that it, a boob can look at Shakespeare and find the literature in it, but when you can grab a comic book off the shelf and show me literature in it, then you're onto something. Okay. Right? Um, so, zombie movies. All right. Okay. What is... Okay, so when you're watching a zombie movie, when you're reading a zombie book or a zombie uh, graphic novel, the thing that comes across is the fact that it's never the zombies who end up really being the bad guy. Resident Evil, the video game, who's the bad guy? Umbrella, a giant corporation. Yep. Uh, the Walking Dead, who's the bad guy? Other people who have survived. Yep. So the zombies uh, are never actually the monster. The monster are other people. So in this, when you're talking about monsters, like literal monsters, it's the SS. Yes. Right? The SS were, were monstrous. But in this novel, the SS doesn't really get mentioned as often. You don't get to see them very often. You no. don't see them very often. It's just like the zombie popping out of the closet, right? It's a scare right then, but then you're left to other people. Okay. So it's the other Jews in this that, that the, real, the real horror comes from, right? Yeah. I mean, they're the ones doing the work. Yes. Uh, and and you know, again, it, can you fault them? Uh, they're following orders. They're doing what they have to do to survive. Because absolutely. they know. It, 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 it's hard to speak from this perspective. Do I know what they knew? No, absolutely not. But it is assumed that their thought process is, this. I, I have to do this. If I do this, I might make it out of here. So I don't think you can fault them. And, and, and I, I, I think you're slightly wrong there. I don't think that there was... Here's the thing. I said at the beginning, one of the bad things about this novel was that it started with the idea that this is almost over. Okay. Right? But as soon as we are in the camps, that's gone. Yes. This feels like forever. This is hell. Yes. Right? Uh, the good days are over. Correct. The end of the war is not coming. It does not matter what happens here. So it does not become, I might get out of this. It becomes, I might let my father die so that I can live to the next day. Yes, and that's another thing, the whole father and son thing. We see yeah. that same thing. You cannot fault the son 
for letting the father die. Right. I mean, that you know happens with the main characters of the novel. He eventually has to let his father pass so that he may survive. But slightly before that. Slightly before that. We also see that happening time and time again because he has a big moral question about that because he sees this. He sees the son eating the father's rations. Yeah. And letting the father waste away. But that is only so the son might survive. And slightly after that story, but before the, the main characters flop, we've got that march Yes. Uh, between the camps. But so is it like a 12-mile march? Right, through snow. Yeah. Where he remembers seeing a boy trample over his father's fallen body. Yeah. Because as soon as you fall, there was an SS officer yeah. waiting to shoot you. you got to keep moving. Yeah. There's no thought about it. And it, it, it's that moral question of... Hey, God forbid it takes you to this dark of a place, but what would you do? Right. What would you do in that situation? I think you have to ask that question when you're reading this. Uh, and that's absolutely necessary. Ellie Weissel does that wonderfully. He makes you think. Because the overarching question of this whole thing is, what if this happens again? Right. Because what, however you want to take it, this was 70 years ago? Yeah. Ish. Uh, that's not that long. Mm-mm. Uh, as far as I know, Ellie Weissel is still alive. Really? I, I'm 99% sure. Don't fact, or please fact check me and let me know. Uh, but there are people who are still living who experience this. Yeah. And that's terrifying to think that in that short of time, you know, we think we've come so far, but could we fall back into something like this? And God, I hope not. Absolutely. But <laughs> it's happened. It's happened once in the. You know what I mean? It. It. You can't put it. <laughs> You like to say that this will never happen again. And look at the beginning of the story. When the Jewish people are first dealing with these circumstances, oh, it's temporary, it's no big deal. Right. No big deal, we're gonna be fine. We're, we're just gonna move for a little camps, while. We're going to a ghetto. It'll be okay. Right. That's how it begins though. Everything's okay, this is just you know inconvenience, but we'll get through it. And then it's just a snowball effect. Yeah, things get worse by, and worse. By Runhold Nemour. Uh, First they came for the Jews, and I was not a Jew, so I did not worry. Or I, I can't remember the exact quote right now, but that that and and someday they came for me, and I know there's no one there to stand up for me. Mm -hmm. Right? That's that's what this novel is. Um, just insanity. Yeah. Uh, any point you want to really bring up? I, I know I'm just murmuring on about my points. So. Well, uh, just a small thing. If you have you ever seen Schindler's List? No, I haven't. Okay. Well, the movie's in black and white. Okay. But the the one time color appears, is this small girl with a red coat. Okay. And we've got this image in here on page 19. Uh, her blonde hair neatly combed, her red coat over her arm. A little girl of seven. And I just wonder if, I wonder if, uh, oh boy, what's his name, drew from this novel for that. For that visual imagery? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, quite possible. Um, I do want to mention something very briefly, because I, I didn't put a lot of work into this, but we got just hammered. This is a translation. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, that makes it even more just harrowing to say that this language is that great in this translated form. Uh, I wish I could read it in its original form. I can't. I don't have the tools to do so. Right. Uh, so. Marion Weissel, by the way, is the translation. the new translation by Marion Weissel. But anyway, so that's addressed. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the death of religion with the main character here. Okay. Did you read the afterword? The Nobel Prize acceptance speech? Yes. Uh, what, what struck you there? Anything in particular? Uh, not, not terribly. I don't know if I took any notes on that or not. Uh, I do know I was just dead at that point. I know there's a point where he's talking about uh, Israel and the changes and whatnot. Uh, let Israel be given a chance. Let hatred and danger be removed from the horizons. So he hasn't lost faith in his right. people. Words of gratitude. First to our common creator. This is what the Jewish tradition commands us to do. At special occasions, one is duty-bound to recite the following prayer. Um, this is this is this is strange to me because through this novel, you have the hallmarks of a person losing their faith. Yes, starts starts off fervently religious, which is if if God is real, what am I doing with my life? by not worshiping him every day. Okay. Right? Because it, when you're religious, this is just a small part, right? It's the forever afterwards that's the big deal. So exactly. you gotta make sure you get there. So the narrator starts that way, and it gets to the point where he's questioning where is God? These things are happening, where is God? Until he eventually answers his question, not here. Yeah. 
correct? And then you get this progression of when someone else mentions God, our narrator laughs at them, right? Yeah. Go ahead, pray to your God. Pray to your God. See uh, it's, where it gets us. It's the scene from the second quote that I read that, of course, I've lost by now, where he is looking. The, where, where, uh, where he is, this is where, hanging from the gallows. This is John Proctor saying God is dead. This is the moment of, uh, this is where the table turns. This is where God has abandoned us. Yeah. Uh, which, again, in a literary sense, just beautifully captured. But now I no longer pleaded for anything. I was no longer able to lament. On the contrary, I felt very strong. I was the accuser. God the accused. So you get to the point where not only are you laughing at someone else's idea of God, but you are accusing this idea of God, of being evil, right? Okay. So, it just to, to yeah, I mean, you've got all the hallmarks of someone losing their faith and becoming an atheist. Yes. Uh, and again, I, I love the fact that there is uh, some of that atheist uh, push into this. Um, it, it's really hard to talk about this in a nonfiction setting. However. When looking from the general portrayal of God, I, I'm not too enveloped into the religious faith or the Jewish faith. Uh, but at this time, wasn't God still perceived as a more fire and brimstone? Uh, was he not the friendly, caring lamb that we get now? Right. Was well, there more harsh aspects to the Christian ideal of God? The Christian ideal of God? Or the Jewish or ideal the Jewish of God. Uh, Yah? Um, uh, whatever. I, yeah. See, I... I I'm not 100% sure. And that's something um, we really should look into because if you look at a fire and brimstone God, a sinners in the hands of the angry God, these are the trials and the tribulations that make you hold your faith. Right. You must endure this and you must have faith because that is the trial. To my understanding, the fire and brimstone God does not come along until uh, Christianity. Okay. Uh, the Judaism God is a very matter of fact God. Yes. Um, if, 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 you, if you do not do these things, there are consequences. Yeah. Right? It's just, that's just how it is. Okay. Um, these are the, the, the trials, like they say several times, these are our trials. These are our tribulations. This is us being lost in the, in the, in the desert for 40 years. Uh, yeah. But looking at a people who in this are clearly following the procedures set forth to them, it would be even worse to say, where is God? Because, yes. I mean, we're doing what we are supposed to be doing. We are keeping our faith. We have always been a good, faithful, religious people. And now God has abandoned us. Yes. Uh, so that makes the whole aspect even worse. I, I, I'm going to be down again after filming this. This is going to be like rereading it. Yeah. Uh, anything else you really want to point out? I have, I have another point if you want to hit on that. Go ahead. Uh, patriarchy in this. Uh, Jewish faith is more... Uh, the Jewish mother is always you know, the, the big, everybody talks about the Jewish mother. Uh, but the Jewish father in the Jewish religion is the head. He is the head of the household. He is the head of everything, the decision maker. To focus on that, I think, is absolutely important. And again, it's interesting to say what he focused on because this is his story of what actually happened. But to focus on his father, I think it's just, it makes this even more powerful. Because to read this from a Jewish perspective, to have to go through these ordeals with your father. And your father is powerless. And your father is powerless. Yes. The man who is the head of your family, who has made all decisions, has no power. And you are now going to have to make the decision to, to abandon him, basically. Right. You are God. Yes. And, and not only that, but these are, these are people who are separate from their captors by that religion. Right? Yeah. The religion is what it is that separates them, that divides them, that is the reason that they are there. And, yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't even think about that. Um, the one thing that struck me about that, I am so glad that this story, and I, this is going to sound extremely superficial or whatever, you know, because, because we're not here. I don't know that I would have been able to get through this book if his little sister went with him. Yeah. And we saw that demise. Yeah. Right? Uh, as a big brother, I, I almost lost it when he's talking about being separated from her. Yeah. And there, oh, I can't, I was looking for it, I couldn't find it. There's this little, there's this small hint at the very first internment camp that they go to that no, his, his sister was thrown in the fire alive. Um, and, and it, at the moment in the book, I 
think that Weissel's character, the narrator, makes this observation without going into depth. How could you? Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm so glad this story didn't get there. Yeah. Um, we got to make a couple suggestions for this. We do. I don't know. Do you want to rate this? I mean, I, I would say wholeheartedly I give this a very high rating, I but I'm not... Have to, to stay in tune with the channel, we okay. have to rate it. I would give this a 95. No, I was going to say 94. This is... Uh, it, there's so many aspects. What you take from it, what you learn from it, the importance of the piece, the beauty of the writing, this is a top read, in my opinion. Right. Uh, a two read. Yeah. Uh, do you have a suggestion to go with this? I struggled with this. Okay. Um, I, Ironic, like I say, because I didn't for once. R Reinhold Nemo, uh, uh, there's a lot of poetry mm -hmm. uh, that circles around the Holocaust. I would suggest some of those. I would suggest seeing Schindler's List if you have not. Um, but as far as a novel, I don't have anything on this level. Okay. Uh, I know the Diary of Anne Frank, Diary of a Young Girl is probably going to be the stereotypical shoot right. for that. Uh, there's a film, and it's based on a book. It's called The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Have you ever seen that, read that? I've, I've seen the book. I have not read it. Okay. I don't know if it is based on a true story. Obviously, it's based on real events. I think it might be a creative nonfiction type thing. Okay. Uh, but this with children trying to cope with this. Wow. So that would be my suggestion. Absolutely. Uh, however, if you like things like this, uh, obviously this is one of our favorites we've read so far. Yeah. Uh, out of the blue as well. Didn't expect to be reading this, and we just picked it up on a whim, and I'm glad we did. Yes. Uh, but if you like things like this, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below. We do this way too much. <laughs> At least weekly. At least weekly. Uh, sometimes daily. Sometimes multiple times a day. Uh, but make sure you do that. Give us a follow for sure.